In the last video, we saw Borgain's embedding and an intuition for why it works. In this video, we will actually prove that it works. So recall the embedding from the previous video. The basic idea is that we're going to choose a bunch of random sets, Sij, and then we're going to define an embedding map, f, which maps x to a big vector of x's distances to each of these sets, Sij. So last time, we kind of described what this embedding does and gave some hand-wavy intuition about why maybe it's a good idea, and now we're going to formally prove it. So we're going to prove the following theorem. So let k be c log squared n. So note that k is the, the number of coordinates here in this vector. Then there is some constant b, so that for all x and y in capital X, the L1 distance between f of x and f of y, so that is the distance in the embedding, is sandwiched between k times the distance between x and y above and k times the distance between x and y divided by b log n below. Thus, this is an embedding with distortion b log n. Okay, so there are two inequalities to prove here, this one and this one. We're going to start with this one, which is easier. Okay, so first, let's prove that the L1 distance between f of x and f of y is no more than k times the distance between x and y. So I claim that it's enough to show that for any set s, the distance from x to s minus the distance from y to s, the absolute value of that, is at most the distance between x and y. So why is that sufficient? So if that were true, then we'd have that the L1 distance between f of x and f of y. So by the definition of the embedding, this is equal to the sum over all i and j of the distance from x to sij minus the distance from y to sij. But if each one of these is bounded above by the distance between x and y, this is just k, the number of sets sij, times the distance from x to y. So as long as this holds for any set s, we'd be good. Another way of saying this is that the map from x to the distance between x and s is non-expanding. But actually, if you recall, we showed this already in the last video. The picture looked something like this. Okay, so let's put a check there. That's done. So now let's move on to the other inequality, which is more difficult. So we want to show that the L1 distance between f of x and f of y is bounded below by the distance between x and y times k divided by b log n for some constant b, where k here is just the number of sets sij that we're considering. So let's recall the intuition that we had from the previous video. So there we were looking at the following situation. So in this situation, we have the closed ball of radius delta about x and the open ball of radius little delta plus big delta about y. Here both of these balls are meant to be with respect to the metric d, although I'm just going to draw them as Euclidean round balls just for the purposes of exposition. So the situation that we were interested in is when the set s intersects the ball around x, but is disjoint from the ball around y. And when that happens, we showed in the previous video that this implies that the distance from x to s minus the distance from y to s is going to be at least capital delta. So what we're going to do now is we're going to choose a bunch of different deltas, a bunch of different radii, and show that this holds with decent probability for a random set s. That will give us some sort of lower bound on this L1 distance because it's just the sum of these coordinates, and we'll show that that lower bound can have this form. Okay, so let's get started by choosing our bunch of different deltas. So let's fix our points x and y, and then I'm going to choose an increasing sequence of deltas, 0, which is equal to delta naught, which is less than delta 1, which is less than delta 2, and so on, all the way up to delta t. And the definition of these deltas is the following. So delta i 
is going to be the smallest value. So it's the ball of radius delta i around x and the ball of radius delta i around y both have at least 2 to the i points in them. So here I'm using the notation, I'm writing in the upper corner here, b of x delta is equal to the set of z in x such that the distance between x and z is at most delta. So to illustrate the definition of these delta i's, consider the following picture. So here I have x, and I have y, and I have a bunch of these blue points that live in my set capital X. So now delta 2 is defined to be the smallest radius so that the balls of radius delta 2 around x and y each contain 2 squared, or 4, points. So here, for y, this ball actually contains more than 4 points, it contains 5 points, but we had to make delta 2 that big so that the ball around x of radius delta 2 contains 4 points. So we sort of grew delta 2 until we hit this fourth point for x. Similarly, delta 3 is going to be the smallest delta so that the balls of radius delta around x and y have 8 points in them. And here, the ball around x of radius delta 3 actually has 9 points but the ball around y has exactly 8. And once again, we sort of increased delta 3 until we caught this last point for y. Okay, so that's the definition of delta naught, delta 1, delta 2, and so on. When do we stop? So we're going to keep choosing larger and larger deltas until we get up to about the distance between x and y divided by 3. So in particular, we're going to stop at the largest t, so that delta t is strictly less than the distance between x and y divided by 3. So in this picture here, suppose that this is the distance between x and y divided by 3, and this is the same, and so is this. Then we're going to keep picking deltas as big as possible until the next delta would take us past this radius. Then we're going to choose delta t plus 1 just to be equal to that radius d of x, y divided by 3. So in this picture, the balls of radius delta t plus 1 about x and y would look like this. OK, so that's how we're going to pick these delta i's. Now I'm going to make two claims. The first claim is the following. So suppose that this nice situation that we talked about before holds. Then the difference between d of x, s and d of y, s is at least delta i plus 1 minus delta i. So in fact, we already saw this. This was sort of our driving intuition from the previous video. This holds since the distance between y and s is at least delta i plus 1, while the distance between x and s is at most delta i, and so their difference is going to be at least delta i plus 1 minus delta i. OK, so that's the first claim. Our second claim, and this is where the probability comes in, is that it's decently likely, over the random choice of s, that this nice situation occurs. So I'm going to make that a bit more precise in a moment, but for now let's start trying to prove it and let's see what we get. So by the definition of delta i plus 1, one of two things occurs. So either, if we consider the open ball of radius delta i plus 1 about x, then there are going to be strictly fewer than 2 to the i plus 1 points of capital X in that ball, or the same thing is going to be true for the ball about y. This follows from the definition of delta i plus 1. If neither of these two things occurred, we would choose delta i plus 1 to be smaller. So without loss of generality, let's assume that this happens for the ball about y. So now the picture looks like this. So now, by the definition of delta i, I know that there are at least 2 to the i points that live in the closed ball of radius delta i about x. So the picture now looks like this. So I have at least 2 to the i points in here, and strictly fewer than 2 to the i plus 1 points over here. So now let's recall from the definition of the embedding that the probability that x is in sij is equal to 2 to the minus i for all x and x. So we can use that to calculate the probability that this nice event occurs. So the probability of the nice event, which I'll draw like this, 
Okay, so I claim that this is equal to the probability that the closed ball around x has a non-trivial intersection with s times the probability that the open ball around y is disjoint from s. This is because these balls are always going to be disjoint. This follows from the fact that we made delta t max out at the distance between x and y divided by 3. And since these balls are disjoint, that means that these two events, the event that s intersects the ball around s and s does not intersect the ball around y, are going to be independent. So then we can just break this up as the product of the, the probabilities of those two events. Okay, but now we can just compute these probabilities. So this first one is at least 1 minus 1 minus 1 over 2 to the i to the 2 to the i. That's because this here, this 1 minus 1 over 2 to the i, this is the probability that a particular point in the ball around x is not in the green set s. And when I raise this to the 2 to the i, I get the probability that all at least 2 to the i points in the ball about x are not in s. And then 1 minus that is the probability that there exists a point in the ball about x that is contained in s, which is what this event is. Moving on to the next event, the event that s is disjoint from the open ball around y. So this probability is at least 1 minus 1 over 2 to the i to the 2 to the i plus 1. And that's because, again, 1 minus 1 over 2 to the i is the probability that a fixed point is not in s. And then I'm raising that to the 2 to the i plus 1, since there are strictly fewer than 2 to the i plus 1 points in the ball around y. So now this is greater than or equal to 1 minus 1 over e, because this quantity is always at most 1 over e, times 1 minus 1 half to the 2 squared. That's because it's not hard to see that this quantity is increasing in i, so if we just choose i equals 1, we'll pick the smallest possible value of it, and that's this. So if you work this out, you'll see that this is at least uh, 1 over 2 to the fifth. Okay, so now we're ready to state a more precise version of claim 2. So claim 2 is as follows. Let's fix i. Now let's consider the probability that at least a 2 to the minus 6 fraction of the sets sij have this good situation happen, where here this s is s i j. Well, this probability is equal to 1 minus the probability that that doesn't happen, namely that the sum from j equals 1 to c log n of the indicator random variable that is 1 if this event occurs is too small. In particular, this is less than the number of j's divided by 2 to the 6, which I can also write as 1 half times c log n divided by 2 to the 5th. So I chose to write it this way because we saw in the previous slide that the expectation of this random variable is at least c log n divided by 2 to the 5th. That's what we just computed. So now this is saying what's the probability that this random variable, which is the sum of independent 0, 1 valued random variables, most half its expectation. This sounds like a job for the turnoff bound. So if we apply a turnoff bound, we see that this is at least 1 minus exp of minus c log n divided by 8 times 2 to the fifth. And this is greater than or equal to 1 minus 1 over n cubed, provided that we choose c large enough. In particular, let's choose c at least 3 times 2 to the 8. Okay, so now let's put it all together. So we just established claims 1 and 2 down here. So now, by a union bound, over all n squared pairs x, y, and all at most log n choices for i, we conclude that with high probability, for all i and for all x and y, at least c log n divided by 2 to the 6 of the sij's have this nice property by claim 2, which by claim 1 implies that they have this property, that d of x sij 
minus d of y sij is at least delta i plus 1 minus delta i. So now we can compute the L1 distance between f of x and f of y. So we have f of x minus f of y, L1 distance. So by definition, this is the sum over all i and j of the distance between x and sij minus the distance between y and sij. And in the favorable case here, if this with high probability statement works out, this is going to be at least the sum over i and j of c log n divided by 2 to the 6. So that's the number of these sij's where we have the favorable outcome times delta i plus 1 minus delta i. So now we have this nice telescoping sum, and everything here cancels except for delta t plus 1 and delta 0. Delta 0 is just 0, so let's ignore it. So we get that this is equal to c log n divided by 2 to the 6 times delta t plus 1. And remember the definition of delta t plus 1, it was just the distance between x and y divided by 3. So this is c log n divided by 3 times 2 to the 6 times the distance between x and y. So that's great. So now recalling that k is equal to c log squared n, where k is just the number of sets sij, we conclude that the L1 norm between f of x and f of y is at least k divided by 3 times 2 to the 6 times log n times the distance between x and y. And this is what we wanted to show, where this 3 times 2 to the 6 is our constant b. Finally, returning to our original theorem, we just established this inequality here, that the L1 norm between f of x and f of y is bounded below by the distance between x and y times k divided by b log n. And remember that we had previously showed this inequality, that it's bounded above by k times the distance between x and y. And so that proves the entire theorem. So in conclusion, this embedding works, and we can embed any endpoint metric space into L1 with big O of log n distortion. So that's pretty cool. All right, that's all for now. Thanks for watching.